Welcome once again to our series of professorial lectures. Uh, delighted to welcome you all here. Um, try and This is the third of our series of three for the current <coughs> academic year. We try and run them once a term, obviously, as uh, some of you will be aware. Um, so we'll start again in the, in the autumn from here. But thanks very much for coming. Um, delighted to welcome Professor Cathy Lewin, our speaker this evening. Um, I've worked with Cathy, I think, pretty much as long as you've been here and I've been here, yes, one way or another. So. Yes. Uh, another of our fantastically successful homegrown professors in the, uh, in the Faculty of Education here at MMU. Um, Cathy has a first degree in maths and computing uh, and started out as a software engineer. engineer. Yes, a software engineer. Went on to do a PhD at the Open University, uh, where she worked in the Centre for Language and Communications uh, at, at the Open University. So that followed her, her PhD, and she became a research fellow in, at, at the Open University. Um, subsequently met uh, Bridget Somek, who is a former <laughs> professor of education here, who some of you uh, may have come across. Uh, Bridget retired some years ago now, um, although we still see her from time to time. Met Bridget, um, got involved in some funded work at both MMU and the OU. I think you were part-time in both places for a while, weren't you, uh, Cathy? Yeah. Uh, and then moved up to MMU full-time in 2003 as a research fellow here, working on various funded projects uh, uh, both her own and, and, with, uh, and with Bridget. Uh, subsequently, um, Cathy has uh, generated a huge amount of income uh, for the university through the various projects that she's secured, including some very large European Union funding, um, and uh, was promoted to Senior Research Fellow, let me just check, Senior Research Fellow in 2009, and Professorial Research Fellow in 2013. Uh, so, as I say, a homegrown professor, a meteoric rise, very successful. Uh, in addition to her projects, in addition to her publishing, uh, she was also in charge of one of our um, impact case studies, as they're now called, in the Research Excellence Framework. Uh, and our, our three case studies were rated 100% three star and four star, which means internationally excellent or world leading. So if you take your pick, you wrote a world leading uh, impact case study as well. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you. Over to you. Thank you, Harry. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, please accept my apologies. I'm going to read from a script because I was worried about waffling and, uh, and going off at a tangent. So I hope I won't um, you know, dally too much in, in terms of reading it and that it will still be engaging for you. So I want to start with some background. My academic endeavours to date have included many evaluations of technology use, primarily in schools. Many of these, particularly for the first 10 years of my career, were government sponsored and uh, so were inextricably linked to policy. I had the opportunity of developing my career during a significant push by the new Labour government to embed technology into the daily practices in school classrooms, as well as to reach out to homes and engage parents through technology. There was a plethora of funding opportunities for research and evaluation, both directly from the education department and also through a government agency, <coughs> the British Educational and Communications Agency, which became known as BECTA. One of the things that has struck me in the last few years is how little change has changed overall, certainly in terms of pedagogic practice in the classroom. Technology is now omnipresent in school contexts, even if not in the hands of learners. It's unusual to find a classroom without some form of display technology, or a school without something resembling a learning platform, even if used predominantly as a repository for content. And from an institutional perspective, all schools have some form of management information system, which makes administration such as record keeping more e efficient. However, in terms of pedagogy or practices in the classroom, the majority of teachers make limited use 
of technology beyond the administration, the resource preparation and presentation. Where learners do get direct access to technology, it is primarily for skills practice or looking up information, which both have their place, but do not necessarily harness the potential of technology, such as opportunities for communication and collaboration. So I've recently begun wondering why this is the case, prompted by the numbers of teachers in a large-scale European project who cited lack of time as a barrier to uptake of technology in the classroom. In this lecture, I would like to reflect on what has changed and what has not changed, and how this relates to the demands placed on teachers' time. In doing so, I am mainly focusing on the experiences of the teacher rather than of the learner, although my work has focused on both over the years. Before I move on, I need to clarify that when I refer to technology, I am using it in its broadest sense to include physical devices such as iPads and laptops, software and apps, and accessing the internet. So let me first turn to the policy rhetoric underpinning the focus on technology when I started my first postdoc position. Here we see evidence of the origins and development of the new Labour government's focus on transforming education through technology. Having been commissioned by the new Labour Party in preparation for being elected to power, in 1997 the Stevenson Report advocated that we wish to see a society within 10 years where ICT has permeated the entirety of education, as it will the rest of society, so that it is no longer a talking point, but taken for granted, rather as electricity has come to be. This independent inquiry into the use of technology in schools concluded that classroom use of technology at the time was primitive and patchy, despite a number of initiatives that had been put in place. The report advocated a five to ten year strategy to embed technology into teaching and learning, supported by massive investment in inf infrastructure, content and teacher training. <coughs> On being elected to government, the new Labour Party were ready and willing to follow the advice of the Stevenson report, launching the National Grid for Learning and a year later the New Opportunities Fund teacher training programme. This government invested over £2 billion between 1998 and 2004 and promoted public-private partnerships to help facilitate infrastructure impl implementation at such a massive scale. And you can see how the transform rhetoric continued with Tony Blair in 1997 asserting that technological change was set to transform education and Charles Clark in 2004 stating that ICT transforms education and the way that children learn. Similarly, key documents included the word transforming in their titles, and some examples are on the screen in front of you now. It is interesting to note how strong the technological determinism is in the policy rhetoric around this agenda. The assumption that technology would without a shadow of a doubt transform education and by implication raise standards. Yet we now know, almost 20 years on, that this rhetoric has not been realised. And in fact some, or perhaps we could say many schools, are still in very similar positions with insufficient infrastructure and limited use of technology in the classroom beyond data projectors and screens to display pre-prepared PowerPoint presentations. And as researchers engaging in an evaluation of the impact of the National Grid for Learning agenda, we too took on that rhetoric of transformation potential, underpinned by <coughs> our passions and enthusiasm for technology to support learning. As you can see, one of our final reports in 2002 included the phrase, it is only the beginning of an ongoing transformation that over time will deliver exciting new opportunities for individuals to personalise their learning and realise their potential in school. Policy documents and literature from academics and practitioners highlight the potential of technology to improve education. And this here, this list, is just a few of those most commonly referred to, from personalisation of learning through adaptation to individual needs to teachers more easily accessing resources and professional networks. 
These lists are compelling and give technology a sense of agency in the improvement agenda. The adoption of technology, it seems, will have positive outcomes for all concerned. Some things have clearly changed. Take this quote from an ICT coordinator from the turn of the century when the internet was only available at specific times. In theory, nowadays, all schools have internet provision and in many cases, wireless networks as well. In practice, of course, there are still times when there are technical issues that restrict or prevent access. Now, this picture isn't very clear, but I'll talk you through it. Here's an ex interesting modern day example which illustrates it, the changes that have happened over time as new <coughs> technologies in this classroom have simply been laid over the top of the previous technologies. Underneath it all is a rolling board which can no longer be used as a static dry whiteboard has been fixed over the top of it and a projector screen has been fixed to the top of the dry whiteboard with accompanying data projector attached to the ceiling. The most recent addition to the classroom is a TV screen which is fixed to the floor and overlapping the previous technologies <laughs> and to which the teacher's laptop is connected. And this has now become the main presentational technology in the classroom, with the history of classroom technologies clearly visible. And some things have not changed in the time that I've been doing research, certainly. This teacher raises two issues. Firstly, that in some subject areas, technology can be at odds with the expected subject norms. Here, the teacher notes that technology could not be used to prepare coursework. A similar example current today would be the need to teach students to write by hand, still the primary medium through which children and young people are assessed in this country. Secondly, the teacher notes the constraints of the curriculum. That is, the teacher perceives that there is little scope for changing current practices, as it is already challenging to cover the material demanded by the syllabus which forms the focus of the subsequent assessments of this knowledge in order to achieve a qualification. So here is a broad overview of the many projects I have been involved with. Initially as a researcher, then as a day-to-day -day project manager, and more recently as a principal <coughs> investigator. The majority of these projects came about as a result of both technological innovation and educational policy drivers. For me, the developments in technology were more explicitly linked to the earlier projects, so they were the starting point for those early projects. The ICT testbed project, for example, centred on saturating schools with technology. It was very much technology driven. More recently, the pedagogy has been more strongly at the heart of the projects and the technologies available have become part of the repertoire of tools available to teachers rather than dri driving the innovation per se. In iTech, for example, a variety of technologies readily available to schools were used to support a shift towards increased collaboration, creativity and reflection in the classroom, amongst other pedagogical strategies. In relation to the policy drivers, the first key strategy from the new Labour government, as I have already mentioned, was the National Grid for Learning from 1998 to 2002. <coughs> which focused on infrastructure, connectivity, content and teacher training. From 2003 to 2005, the focus shifted to ICT pedagogy and the whole school improvement through the ICT in Schools programme, which was strongly also linked to the workforce reform agenda. And in 2006, the Harnessing Technology Strategy was launched with four key aims, to transform teaching and learning, to engage the so-called hard-to-reach learners, to improve access to online information for a wide variety of stakeholders, including parents and children, and to achieve greater efficiency and effectiveness. So the Transform agenda remained prominent and the focus on <coughs> efficiency and effectiveness became more explicit. And of course, the overarching agendas of raising attainment and preparing young people for future careers by ensuring that they have digital skills have remained high profile throughout. 
These economic drivers designed to ensure the country remains globally competitive and the workforce adequately trained to maintain and improve productivity are clearly visible throughout the policy documents in our country and are equally prominent at in international level. So what I have observed from my engagement in all these projects and others over the last 18 years is a common pattern. A new technology is introduced to the education sector and technology, of course, is a moving target under constant develop, de, de, development and innovation itself. Policy makers see opportunities for ways in which this technology can support their aims, driven by the common sense notion that technology is here to stay, and as it plays such a key role in our lives, both social and working, it has to be part of education. <coughs> An intervention is then conceived, or an evaluation of existing practices is commissioned. In many cases, but not all, the evaluation focuses on schools and teachers who choose to participate. These are commonly the early adopters of technology and or those who are excited by the thought of innovating their practice. These groups are the tip of the iceberg and not necessarily representative of the wider teaching population. They enthusiastically participate and many engage in some really interesting practices with technologies in their classrooms. But even the early adopters and enthusiasts are faced with many barriers and have many competing demands on their time. We can comment on the immediate outcomes, but we don't often know what happens after the projects and evaluations finish. In the Web2 in Secondary Schools project, we returned to some of the schools that had participated in the Impact2 project some five years earlier. And we found schools which had previously had a reputation for innovative use of technology that were then focused on other priorities following staff changes, including new head teachers. In one such school, the internet had been locked down such that students' access to technology was tightly controlled. We know that strong support from leadership drives innovation with technology, and where that isn't present, individual technology enthusiasts struggle to counter the many challenges and barriers they face. So on reflection, throughout all of my projects, it's a case of history repeating itself. And it's been happening since technology was first really introduced into the classroom in the 1960s. It's just a common pattern that keeps replicating. So I'll now focus on three of the projects that I've engaged in to illustrate attempts to transform education through technology, starting with the ICT Testbed project. The ICT Testbed project involved three clusters of schools and further education colleges in areas of social deprivation. <coughs> the aim was to explore what could be achieved through massive investment in technology across leadership and man management, teaching and learning, workforce development, cross-institutional relationships, and home community links. These themes all linked to the wide range of policy agendas that were current at the time. For example, the Schools Achieving Success white paper published in 2001 included a focus on teacher workload, grounded in concerns about pressures placed on teachers leading to many leaving, leaving the profession. This is issue remains today. At the time, the rationale was that technology would reduce teacher workload and enable them to spend more time teaching. <coughs> I'm sure that many teachers would agree that technology has indeed made it easier for them in relation to locating, preparing and sharing teaching resources, for example. What was interesting about Testbed was that it was a whole school innovation and involved all staff from the caretaker to the head teacher. There was lots of support with change management strategies, help with procurement and funding to release staff in the schools to manage the project and to appoint technical support staff. The speed at which things happened meant that it was a big bang approach rather than through incremental change. Indeed, in one cluster, the teachers arrived one day to find that their dry whiteboards had been taken away and replaced with interactive whiteboards whilst in another cluster, the projector screen came down over the dry whiteboard, meaning that it could not be used at the same time as the new technology. 
The, these teachers in testbed had very little choice other to, than to use these new classroom technologies that were, that were installed almost overnight. So all classrooms had display technologies and the schools purchased kit for students to use such as laptops and digital video recorders. Each cluster was given guidance by the local authority and individual schools had some choices over how to spend their money. Here you can see an image of a primary school classroom where they had chosen to put more technology in the classroom rather than in an IC tweet, uh, IC, ICT suite, which at the time was a popular way of introducing technology into schools by clustering all of the technology together in one room. So instead they chose computers that were set into the desks so that they could be used at any time and folded down when not in use. So you can see the example of the, uh, the computer that folded down into the desk there. And in the background uh, is a visualiser, which is one of these here, uh, or a document camera, which in this particular cluster they'd opted for rather than interactive whiteboards um, for very strong rationales uh, relating to things like the, um, using the data projector and a, and a projector screen meant that the screen was much lar larger than the screen size of the interactive whiteboards at the time. So here you can see, uh, uh, almost if you squint, <laughs> um, a visualiser in use with a secondary school teacher who was demonstrating the dissection of a flower. And here the technology served the purpose of making teaching more efficient and more effective, with no need to ask students to crowd around a single desk and enabling all students to see the teacher's actions very clearly from wherever they were sitting. And here is an example of a resource created by a primary school teacher who was in her second year of teaching <coughs> when the project began. <coughs> she had previously used her dry whiteboard as a planning tool for her class and set about finding an alternative way of achieving this with the technologies that were made available to her. She started with PowerPoint, but she wanted to be up, able to update the table points and the golden time uh, in order to um, uh, keep the children motivated during the day. And she wanted to update them in real time and there and then. So she moved to Excel. And this page then provided a central focus for her daily activities with links to the resources that she planned to use throughout the day as she moved from one subject to the next. Here, the use of technology certainly made classroom management and management of teaching and learning much easier for the teacher. In concluding her action research report, the teacher commented that the children found it visually stimulating. The daily board, which is what she called this, uh, offered helpful support to three children in her class with special needs. And it made the transitions between lessons <coughs> much swifter as she clicked on the links to the different PowerPoint presentations and what other, other resources she planned to use that day uh, from this main uh, um, daily board. And that for her resulted in improvement in class behaviour. The findings of the ICT testbed project were very, very positive indeed. There was a positive impact on attainment, although interestingly there was a technology dip after the first year when results were negatively affected as the innovation bedded in. There was more classroom interaction, which was attributed to the introduction of the classroom presentation technologies and an increase in student-centred learning. Assessment was considered to be more effective and the use of management information systems made daily um, registration easier and supported data-based decision-making, amongst other things. So, some brief reflections on time issues in ICT testbed then. Initially, school leaders struggled, as they were expected to decide very quickly how to spend the money that they had been given. Yet the majority of them didn't understand or couldn't even imagine the educational possibilities of the range of technologies on offer. They were also trying to juggle with the day-to-day -day management requirements of running a school, as this first quote from a head teacher illustrates. So the head teacher says, 
You just cannot do things instantly. There are other things that take priority in the school. ICT testbed is only one strand of the school. Although time as a barrier did not emerge from the data gathered in this project, clearly all staff in the schools involved had to engage with changes to their practice at various levels. And this takes time, as recognised by the second quote here, which should, suggests that teachers need time to develop technology resources and that this time should be formally recognised in uh, the organisation of the school. And finally, this quote from Oster presents an interesting outsider's, outsider's perspective that in one um, ICT testbed school, technology had gained too much attention at the expense of other important activities, even though it was recognised that the use of technology was outstanding. And so Ofsted said, while the use of our ICT is outstanding and has considerably enhanced the skills of pupils and teachers, it has made many demands on staff and other priorities have received insufficient time. The next project I would like to focus on is Innovative Technologies for an Engaging Classroom, or ITEC. This was a European funded project involving 26 partners, including ministries of education, commercial providers and universities. ITEC was designed to scale up technology use in the classroom and address the so-called mainstreaming problem. Really, this is the same problem that I am now concerned with and perhaps my involvement with ITEC has influenced me in this regard. The project was pedagogically driven and developed a scenario-led design process for teachers to develop classroom activities with high levels of technology use. The pedagogical innovation focused on student-centred approaches and the development of what some term 21st century skills, such as collaboration and problem solving. Training and support were provided at central and national levels. <coughs> Teachers were encouraged through these resources to make incremental changes to their practice rather than radical changes. The resources were intended to be inspirational and flexible rather than prescriptive. This was seen by the project team as the most likely way to get teachers on board and to support them to change their practices in a manageable and a sustainable way. The project also developed a number of <coughs> technology prototypes with the aim of making lesson planning more efficient. Approximately 2,000 teachers and 50,000 students participated in the project across four years. The findings suggest that they were positive outcomes for the students, but I'll focus here on the teachers. There was an increase in their technology use. Teachers felt that their pedagogical practice had changed and that they had become more engaged and motivated to teach. There was also an increase in teachers collaborating and sharing ideas, a process which was facilitated by technology. And that took place at many levels, from uh, teachers collaborating with peers in their own schools to collaborating with other schools in their region and in their country, and also collaborating with teachers across boundaries in other countries as well. You can see from these images that in iTech, ta tablet technologies had made an impact, both inside the classroom but also outside school. So the photograph at the bottom here in the centre is of students who had gone out on a trip to um, gather uh, information about an architectural um, building and they were capturing that uh, on, on the iPad. And in fact, actually they're, they're also communicating with another couple of students who are elsewhere, so they're, they're doing some uh, video conferencing at that point. And the other pictures you can see they're using the iPads to collaborate and, and on their own as well. And the picture down there in the corner is uh, the result of one of the projects which was focused on design and making. And in this particular example, uh, the students ended up making a cake which they decorated with the uh, logo of the project, iTech. Despite good intentions to make lesson planning 
and the process of changing practice easier and more efficient, the majority of teachers felt that a lack of time was the most significant challenge for them. This manifested itself in various ways, from the time needed to learn how to use the technologies they were not familiar with, to that needed to network with peers in order to share practice and learn from others. Planning and preparation, of course, demanded additional time. And the curriculum and timetabling, both institutional mechanisms of control, were frequently referred to by these teachers. Of course, underpinning all of this was the need to ensure that students achieve in end of schooling assessments, the primary goal of teaching as imposed by policy and accountability demands. This concern with performance may also have been behind the parents who were worried about that their children were spending too much time using technology in school at the expense of doing what they saw as more important stuff. Uh, so these examples here from the iTech project, um, then we need time even outside the school because the teacher has to master all these technologies before using them in the classroom. But if there is a passion, this becomes a new opportunity for enriching professionalism. So that indicates the time that teachers need to give in order to learn how to use the technology, think about how to use it in the classroom, think about how to make it fit with their curriculum and the, and the needs of the curriculum. But that if there is a passion, so if you have uh, beliefs in the potential of using technology in the classroom, then uh, you know, that sees them through and they can um, begin to use the technology in their classroom and um, reap some positive rewards. So the final project I would like to refer to is the DISCOVER project. DISCOVER was a reinvention of schooling through spatial, technological and organisational reorganisation. A £13 million revamp of the school took place so that students would self-manage learning, positioned by staff as being in the driving seat. The project was fuelled by the personalisation agenda and the Building Schools for the Future agenda, which focused on improving school buildings and investing in technology infrastructure. The dramatic changes included dispensing with timetables, switching from traditional classrooms to open plan learning spaces, 15 minute tutorials with teachers, new roles for teachers and other staff, and a thematic cross-curricular approach. Teachers tasked with supporting students in the open plan learning spaces were required to develop generalist skills and knowledge in addition to their specialist subject knowledge. And this was a secondary school. All students were given a laptop and a new learning platform was established with teachers encouraged to populate it with content to support students' independent learning. In addition, the school developed a sophisticated assessment system to track students' progress. So they were able to identify students who needed additional help and support in a timely manner. Students managed their own learning through a learning journey, which was a planning tool. Um, they decided what subjects they were going to do at what times of the day, which tutorials they were going to attend. They had a choice of tutorials to attend, um, you know, and how they would spend their time. And they also managed their learning, uh, their achievement through a passport, which was stamped once they had provided sufficient evidence of attainment. The new approach was intended to make learning and teaching flexible and give students more autonomy. I visited the school during three periods of their transition as they rolled out the approach with new year groups. As a whole school innovation involving enthusiastic and committed staff, there were very few references to the lack of time as a challenge to be addressed. Rather, staff spoke about increased flexibility in time. For example, uh, the new arrangements gave them opportunities to talk to students more regularly and to spend more time with individuals so that they could get a better knowledge of their needs. They were also able to interact with other staff and a staff from other curriculum areas in ways that they had not done previously. At 
visits to this school, it really did feel as if something very different was happening at all levels. It certainly looked very different. It felt exciting and everyone was optimistic that students would benefit hugely from the experience, both in relation to academic achievement, but also in relation to the development of self-management skills, resilience and determination. However, the project was ended abruptly, just before the Year 11s who had started with the initiative when they were in Year 7 were due to sit their GCSE exams. An Ofsted inspection the previous year had raised concerns about the quality of the teaching, although Ofsted were positive about and encouraging of what they described as the school's visionary approach. The following year, a new head teacher was appointed with very different views about how a school should operate, and following a short review of the Discover approach, he set about returning the school, both spatially and organisationally, to the way it had been before. Over the summer holidays, the large open plan spaces were turned back into classrooms and a timetable was reintroduced. So, I would like to end this lecture by revisiting my original question. Is transformation through technology possible? In my work, I draw on social cultural theories and most recently I've returned to activity theory as a means of understanding innovation and change. Activity theory enables you to consist, consider a system as a whole and how individuals pursue goals mediated by tools like technology and artefacts. Activity theory also takes into account the context. We consider who else is involved in the activity, who is part of the community, what their specific roles and responsibilities are, and the system rules and procedures that community members must abide by and follow. Engerstrom's more recent work <coughs> also draws attention to the interactions between coexisting and overlapping activity systems. There can be, and often are, contradictions between elements within a system as well as between systems. For example, in a school context, restrictive rules about internet use, such as when and what, can work against the goals of student autonomy and flexibility. Identifying and resolving such contradictions can lead to productive change in systems. However, if su such contradictions cannot be resolved, then system change is constrained or even non-existent. The problem faced by teachers and the demanding workloads they have is both internal and external. Internal in relation to competing goals that oblige them to make choices and prioritise. This leads them to say that time is a barrier for some activities. And external in relation to the pressures of a neoliberal state education system which is underpinned by instruments of performativity such as school league tables, competition, performance management systems and target setting. In the case of Discover, structural system changes such as open plan learning spaces and abandoning the timetable were not enough on their own. The contradiction between the goal of putting the learner in the driving seat and the external accountability measures was not resol resolvable. The pressure of achieving good results was too high. Similar pressures were felt by the teachers in ITEP across Europe. The demands of covering the curriculum in order to achieve good results in formal examinations was prioritised over changing pedagogical practices. In addition, these teachers found it difficult to find the time required to prepare and plan for such changes. It was not a high priority for them to do so. Of course, there are also <coughs> risks involved in such endeavours which can act as a deterrent. What happens if the technology doesn't work, for example? And there are still uncertainties about which uses of technologies are appropriate and valuable. Teacher beliefs about the potential of technology in education are also hugely influential. The evidence to date on the impact of technology on attainment is mixed. 
And that can be attributed to the complexity of education systems and even the technology itself, which is a broad umbrella term covering, covering a myriad of hardware and software. Of course, there clearly have been changes over time, but they relate to efficiency and effectiveness as evidenced through the ICT testbed project. There, classroom display technologies, the preparation and sharing of digital resources and management information systems have made management, preparation and administration easier, saving staff time. These common sense uses of technologies have of course become part of the fabric of educational institutions. Similarly, in Discover, the use of a sophisticated system for tracking student progress was also touted as a major improvement, enabling the teachers to swiftly identify students who were off track and needed more or different support. These uses of technology to improve efficiency, however, also bring other issues of surveillance and control, which of course are strongly influenced by the external focus on performativity. I believe that technology has a place in education, and I believe that it can make a difference. It's by no means a panacea for all problems, and I don't believe that it should be used exclusively. Rather, technology should be a tool to be used when relevant and when beneficial. Technologies that support the aims and values of existing activity systems are readily adopted but those that introduce competing goals and the risk of, unknown, of the unknown face major barriers and challenges. Only passionate early adopters of technology have the drive to give such technologies priority and give it the time it inevitably needs to integrate it into practice. As the OECD noted in their recent report in 2015, while technology has revolutionised every aspect of life and work, schools lag considerably behind the promise of technology. Having started my career believing that technology could indeed transform ed education under the right conditions, I'm now not so sure. I think I'm closer to agreeing with Larry Cuban that there have been hybrid changes with teachers adopting a mix of old and new ideas, but with teaching practices fundamentally remain, remaining the same. At the moment, the state education practices and requirements prevent things from being otherwise. Thank you. Um, absolutely excellent lecture. I mean, you have such such an overview of of how this material and has been introduced, um, developed, ignored, uh, resisted uh, over over a period of time. I mean, one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking also was that just the the changing ideologies of government and the sort of policies that, mm -hmm. that um, influence this, you know, how interesting it is that it was the new Labour government that had a sort of transformative, you know, visionary uh, view of this, albeit one that perhaps didn't get as far as it might have done. Meanwhile, of course, we've got, you know, Michael Gove and Nicky Morgan and so forth introducing parsing in primary schools and uh, it absolutely back to the future with, uh, with the current government. But thank you very much, really excellent lecture.